Thank you very much for the kind introduction. As introduced, my name is Jin Hee Lee. Today, I'd like to talk about ICH S1B, which is the the carcinogenicity studies for the human pharmaceuticals. Uh, there was a revision in August last year, so we'll, I will go over the revision. So this is the agenda, and as you know, ICH is the International Council on Harmonization of Technical Requirement for Pharmaceuticals for Human Use, which means it involves regulatory bodies and the pharma companies in order to achieve the harmonization of the technological or the technical requirement for the pharmaceutical development. So under ICH, uh, we have regulatory members and also the regional representation and also the industry members. And for each class, uh, we have founding member, a standing member, and also regular member and also standing observers and uh, regular observers. Europe, FDA of the US and PMDA of Japan are the founding members for the regulatory uh, body. And as here you can see Health Canada and Swissmatic are the standing members. And ICH uh, S1B guidelines uh, revision actually has been led by these five uh, regulatory members. And these are the most active members uh, in the ICH. And of course, MFDS is a one of the regulatory members of the ICH. And here you can see Korea, uh, Britain, Brazil, China, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Taiwan, Turkey, Mexico, and Egypt for the regulatory members. And for industry, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical associations of the Europe, Japan, and the US also IGBA and Global Self-Care Federation and BIO. So these are how the ICH is organized and how it is being operated. And there are many different guidelines from the ICH depending on the topic domains. There are four uh, domains, as you know, quality, safety, efficacy, and multidisciplinary, so QSEM. And uh, today's focus for my presentation would be S which is the safety, and among the safety-related guidelines, I will focus on S1, uh, carcinogenicity, because I am a detoxicological researcher. I usually working work with the safety uh, part, and we have like 20 guidelines, including the Q&A for S, the safety part. And this is how the ICH guideline ha is uh, adopted from step one to step five. Before we have the step one, there was a pre-work. The ICH members and observers are entitled to provide or offer the new topic. Then the assembly accept it, endorse it, uh, then endorse or approve the draft of the uh, proposal. The management committee will form a informal uh, working group, and that informal working group will draft the final proposal and the activity plan. Then the uh, the MC, the management committee, will approve it. So these are the pre-steps before the uh, step one. Then it would be followed by the ICH development, ICH guideline development process. So step one is preparing a technical document, and step two is uh, drafting the guideline draft, and also the adoption by the regulatory members. And step three is the public consultation for different countries. So people, the public, can provide the feedback on the, uh, the draft of the revision. And the feedbacks will be uh, deliberated and reflected into uh, the guideline draft. And then step four will be the adoption of the ICH guideline. So ICH S1B uh, went through the step four last year, August. And step five is about implementing uh, that guideline in different countries which means that uh, the, uh, the authorities in different countries adopt and actually implement the guideline. And S1B here in Korea is uh, under the step five uh, step. 
And what about the ICHS1? If you visit the ICH website, you will see the different categories. And if you look at the safety guideline, S1 has S1A and B and C. So S1A is about the need for carcinogenicity studies of the pharmaceuticals. So it's, it's, all, it's about need. And S1B is the testing for carcinogenicity of pharmaceuticals. And S1C is a dose selection for carcinogenicity studies of pharmaceuticals. So then what is carcinogenicity testing? And as you know well, the objective of carcinogenicity studies are to identify a tumorigenic potential or the carcinogenic potential in animals and to assess the relevant risk in humans. And we in Korea have the a notification from the MFDS, which is about the regulation and the review of the pharmaceutical product, and also a regulation on the toxicological testing for the pharmaceuticals. So as I said, as one of the ICH guideline has three parts, which is S1A and B and C. S1A is for the need of carcinogenic studies. So the guidelines adoption, this guideline adoption was conducted in uh, November uh, 1995. So this guideline clearly specify what needs to be uh, tested for the carcinogenicity, uh, like previous uh, demonstration, the, if the uh, pharmaceuticals is the one that the people are exposed to more than or longer than six months. And as for the cause for concern, meaning that if there is any concern for the carcinogenic potential, then we can consider carcinogenesis study, uh, which means previous demonstration of carcinogenic uh, potential in the product class that is considered relevant to human, or structure activity relationship is also uh, considered, and evidence of uh, pre neoplastic lesions in repeated dose toxicity studies, or long term tissue uh, retention of apparent compounds or metabolites resulting in local tissue reaction, or other pathophysical or physiological responses, these are the conditions or the uh, instances where the pharmaceuticals is considered to be uh, concerned. And of course, unequivocal uh, genotoxic compounds uh, are presumed to be transespecies carcinogenic carcinogens, uh, meaning that there is a hazard to a uh, human. And such compounds need not to subject to long-term carcinogenicity studies. But however, it's not always clear whether uh, there is a genotoxic compound, uh, whether it is a genotoxic compound or not. And as for the indications and the patient, so the pharmaceuticals for life-threatening or severely debil uh, debilitating diseases or the life expectancy in the indicated population is uh, too short, then for this uh, population and for this pharmaceuticals, no need for the carcinogenicity uh, study. And also for different salts, uh, acid or basis of the same therapeutic moiety, uh, evidence should be provided that there is no significant change in pharmacokinetics, uh, pharmacodynamics, or the toxicity. So I just talked about the uh, S1A. And uh, moving to the S1B, it was adopted in 1997, which was the step four. The basic uh, principle of the carcinogenicity testing is that two-year red study, so to, as a long-term red study, and plus one additional study. So the long one long-term carcinogenicity study and plus one additional testing. These are the basic principle. And for the additional uh, study, uh, two options are provided, short or medium term, in vivo road and test a system. So the uh, trans, uh, the like P53 or TGAC or uh, uh, trans H2 models and these transgenic models are being used. And the second option can be for the long term carcinogenicity, we usually apply two year RET. So, as an uh, option here, long term carcinogenicity study in a second rodent species, which is many cases mouse. And here, long term, it means usually 
one year and six months. So for the additional testing, these two are uh, recommended. And for the species selection, pharmacology, repeated dose toxicology, metabolism, TK, and ROA need to be considered so that the appropriate species can be selected. The next is about S1C, which is uh, the dose selection guideline. It was uh, it was revised for two times. So the, the revision here, uh, the guideline itself was adopted in 1994, and there was a first revision in 2005, and the second revision in uh, 2008. So the title was changed, and the three R principles was considered. So here, when the dose is selected, MTD, or the maximally tolerated dose, need to be considered. So the, clearly, the toxicology can be observed while uh, the subject is not dying. And also the AUC for the toxicokinetic, pharmacokinetic endpoint, and saturation of the absorption, and MFD, maximum feasible dose, and the limit dose. These are the things that are, are recommended to be considered uh, to select the dose. Then let us move to the S1B guideline. I will talk about the context or the background of the revision and the progress. If you look at the um, the concept paper, and actually this provides the background for the S1B revision, the concept paper provides these things on the slide. For example, a large number of drugs were negative in a two-year carcinogenicity test, and repeated dose toxicity studies in rats showed no histopathologic uh, evidence of for example, hyperplasia. And also, in 2011, the US PHRMA looked at 182 substances and found that in chronic toxicity tests, if xenotoxicity, hormonal changes, and histologic changes are negative, then the chronic toxicity of the two ear uh, is predicted to be negative. And they, these kind of substances account for 30 to 40 percent of all substances. But the regulators, when they had a discussion, they also believe that there is a pharmacodynamic aspect to the carcinogenic substances, and there is also potential for the false positive. So there was a, a carcinogenicity testing. Then uh, we also have to consider three R principles. So provide, so by utilizing very different and diverse uh, data, so we need to provide an evidence of a producti predictability of human carcinogenicity with a variety of relevant data to justify exemption from the two-year red carcinogenicity test data. So that was the reason or the background why the revision was initiated. And in the regulatory notice document, you can see that the ICH category uh, are, are provided, something that you are seeing on the slide. And the carcinogenicity testing materials are received uh, from the industry. And then the category uh, can be uh, divided into four. 1, 2, 3A, and 3B. If you look at the category 1, it's a tumorogenic in human. It's likely to, highly likely to tumorogenic in human. And therefore, the two-year uh, transgenic carcinogenic studies would not add value. And therefore, a two-year red carcinogenicity study can be exempted. That's the category 1. And for the category 2, in human, there is uncertain humorogenic uh, potential for human. And therefore, the rodent carcinogenicity studies are likely to add value to human risk assessment, which means for category B, two-year uh, study is needed. And category 3A, it's difficult. It seems to be it's likely to be tumorogenic in rats, but not in humans because it's well-recognized mechanism known to be human irrelevant. And therefore, here, for 3A, two-year red uh, carcinogenicity study can be waived. And for 3B, 
for both rat and human, it's highly likely not B tumorigenic and therefore two year red carcinogenic uh, study is not needed. And so the waiver can be given uh, here again to the 3B category. So these are the categories for the, uh, the carcinogenicity red study. So regulatory notice document shows that the scope of the assessment you can see here. Weight of evidence need to be considered and described. And the regulatory bodies and the industry have to uh, uh, discuss together on the category of the pharmaceuticals. Uh, and the biotechnology-derived uh, products are not included. Biotechnology-derived uh, pharmaceuticals and therefore uh, will be excluded from this regulatory notice document. And the carcinogenicity assessment document will not include uh, the uh, testing longer than one year and a half, which is the 18 month. And in order to have the justification for the waiver of two year red carcinogenicity testing, at least 50 uh, testings uh, are likely to be needed. And the regulatory bodies are usually uh, interested in the uh, category three. And also, the review of this document is for the waiver of the two year red carcinogenicity testing, and it is not for the carcinogenicity testing with mouse. And when the uh, CAD or the carcinogenicity uh, assessment document is reviewed, so weight of evidence approach need to be approached or the taken and that will be uh, reviewed. And also the weight of evidence, the evidences need to be described in relation to the carcinogenicity. And Planned or ongoing two year red carcinogenicity need to be described in order to predict the actual uh, carcinogenicity and the two year red carcinogenicity expected result uh, should be uh, discussed. So if you look at this, so the topic was adopted in 10 years ago for the revision and then there have been a series of EWG meeting to provide the uh, the draft for the revision. And the March 2021 S1 Step 1, the technical document drafting has been signed off. And S1 Step 2 and the guideline revision has been prepared as a document. And in Step 3, the public consultation uh, were conducted for three months, starting from June 2021. And there were a many EWG meetings, although it was not face-to-face -face meeting, the virtual meetings were held many times so that we can actually reflect the feedback to the revision. So ICHB uh, Step 3 has been completed June 2022. And in August 2020, the uh, the revision guideline was uh, adopted. So what has been revised? We do have the S1B guideline. That's the part one. And there is a part two, addendum to testing the carcinogenicity in pharmaceuticals. So it's a kind of an addendum to the S1B. So it's a part two in the S1B guideline. The very first part of the addendum is the preamble. And it clearly says that this addendum is complementary to the S1 guideline and is not intended to replace the existing S1B guideline. And as for the scope, S1, as I said, S1A is for need. So here are the scope for the S1B uh, R1 is to embrace all pharmaceutical agents that need carcinogenicity testing. And for the biotechnology derived pharmaceuticals, refer to guideline as 6. And for the purpose, there are two uh, objectives are provided. 
of course, um, to decide the wavier for the two-year red carcinogenicity testing is, of course, important. But at the same time, um, it is to provide an in integrative approach that provide a scientific weight of evidence criteria that inform whether or not a two-year study is likely to add to a human carcinogenicity risk assessment. It sounds difficult. However, basically what it says is that if the other, there is a clear indication that uh, there is a, a carcinogenicity risk in human or not in human, then the two-year red carcinogenicity testing can be exempted. And here, another purpose is to add a plasma exposure ratio-based approach for setting the high dose in the ras h 2 tg mouse model. So these are the two purposes stated in this part. For the background, there are two backgrounds are provided. Um, since the publication of the uh, S1B guidelines, scientific advances toward elucidation of mechanisms of the carcinogenicity, greater understanding of the limitations of the rodent models, and several retrospective analysis of pharmaceutical data sets indicate that two-year red carcinogenicity studies might not add value to carcinogenicity risk. So the carcinogenic potential could have been assessed adequately based on a comprehensive assessment of all of available pharmacological, biological, and toxicological data. And second part of the background is about AUC. So on exposure ratio and point based on animal to human plasma AUC for high dose selection in two year rodent studies uh, has not been globally accepted for use in the RAS H2TG mouse study. And actually PMDA has conducted retrospective um, analysis and they found that a 50-fold plasma AUC exposure ratio is an adequate criterion for high dose selection. So uh, evidence, the weight of evidence approach to assess the human carcinogenic potential of the pharmaceuticals. Here, uh, the, these are there are three uh, potentials. I talked about how CAD were uh, reviewed, and also I talked about uh, basically uh, four uh, categories under the CA uh, review. But here we have three: likely, such that a two-year red carcinogenic study would not add value, meaning that the test the study is not needed, and second, unlikely. So such that a two-year red carcinogenic study would not add value. Three, uncertain, such that a two-year red carcinogenicity study should, would add value to human risk assessment. So these are the three approaches based on the weight of evidence. So depending on the weight of evidence approach, we can decide whether we uh, can exempt a two-year red carcinogenicity study or not. So as you can see from the uh, slides, the ICH provides a kind of a decision tree. So if there is a, a highly put high potential for the human uh, carcinogenicity, then uh, it's not the, the two-year red carcinogenicity study would not add value. And of course, the weight of evidence uh, should be documented. It's not just for the two-year red carcinogenesis study, but also the mouse study. The regulatory consultation is needed in order to decide whether the two-year or the mouse carcinogenesis study can be uh, exempted or not. So it's not likely that automatically simply because uh, this product is falling into uh, one of these category, uh, which may waive the two-year red carcinogenesis study, automatically uh, the study is uh, not waived. You need to have the regulatory uh, consultation. <clears throat> And the carcinogenic potential, if there is no carcinogenic potential in human, then uh, the weight of evidence document need to be done. Then also, again, the regulatory consultation need to be conducted to uh, decide whether the two-year study actually can be uh, exempted. And here, in principle, the mouse carcinogenic study need to be conducted.
And for the mouse study, some cases, in some cases, mouse study may not be appropriate, meaning that mouse study uh, can be conducted or cannot be conducted. So it's quite wide open. So, and I will talk about it later on. In principle, anyway, no carcinogenic potential in potential in a human, then basically, and as a principle, the mouse study needs to be conducted, but in some cases, it may not be appropriate. And the third category, which is uncertain, and as it uh, got recommended in the S1B, the two-year red carcinogenicity study need to be conducted, and also additional in vivo carcinogenicity study need to be conducted. So these two need to be uh, done. So it should be a very important information that we have to remember. And in guideline, uh, there are six uh, considerations for the weight of evidence assessment. The first one is the, uh, the drug target biology and uh, pharmacological mechanism uh, of the parent compound and active major human metabolite. So biological and the mechanism are considered here. The second consideration is the secondary of pharmacology screens. What it means is that the target selectivity of the uh, pharmaceuticals, whether it is high or not, and the off-target potential, if there is any uh, off-target potential, these things can be uh, informed through the secondary pharmacology screens. And third consideration is the histopathology data, particularly uh, for the six-month study. And fourth consideration is the hormonal perturbation, particularly uh, the weight and growth and microscopic changes in endocrine and reproductive organs from the repeated dose uh, toxicity studies. And fifth consideration is the geno uh, genetic toxicology study data, equivocal genotoxicity data that cannot be resolved in accordance with the ICHS2. Our one recommendation increases uncertainty with respect to the carcinogenic potential. So that's the uh, number five consideration. And the last one is evidence with immune modulation. Um, if the evidence of the broad immune uh, uh, suppression may provide sufficient concern for the human risk, and that should be considered. And therefore, the two-year red uh, study can be uh, waived because there is a, a certain concern for the human risk. So these are the six considerations for the uh, weight of evidence approach. And actually, there are footnotes for the number three and number uh, four. So when we review uh, the histopathological uh, data, so histopathology uh, findings from six months red toxicity study of the particular interest for identifying carcinogenic potential in two year red study include cellular hypertrophy, cellular hyperplasia, persistent tissue injury, chronic inflammation, falsity of cellular alteration, preneoplastic changes, and tumors. And for the short term, the histological value can be added. It's not just for the red, but also non-red, such as mouse. So data from long-term toxicity studies in non-rodents and mice uh, may also be useful for providing additional context on the human relevance of the red study findings. And for the uh, weight of evidence, uh, number four, which is the hormonal perturbation, it says findings for, from red toxicity studies suggesting hormonal perturbation may include microscopic changes in endocrine or reproductive tissues of atrophy, hypertrophy, and hyperplasia, and biologically significant endocrine and reproductive organ weight changes. So this is stated in the footnote. So I just talked about six for the WE or weight of evidence assessment, but that does not mean that the six are the only things that need to be considered. Whether one or more WOE factors may be inconclusive or indicate a concern for carcinogenicity, then the sponsor can apply investigative approaches that could address that uncertainty or inform human relevance of the identified risk. 
For example, um, the additional investigative, investigative studies may include a special uh, histochemical stain, molecular biomarkers, serum hormone levels, and immune cell function in vitro in vivo test systems, data from emerging technologies and others. So it's quite wide. And second, the clinical data generated to inform human mechani uh, mechanistic uh, relevance at the therapeutic doses and exposures, such as urine, drug concentrations, and evidence of crystal formation and others. So other than the six factors, if the data uh, are believed to be useful and valuable, then these data can be considered for the WOE approach. So six factors were presented for the WOE. So Two-year study can be waived or should be conducted on this slide. So on the right side of this slide, the two-year red study may not be needed. Target biology, the well-characterized biological pathway, if that is the case, then carcinogenesis study may not be needed. But if the characterization is poor, then the carcinogenicity study, two-year study need to be uh, conducted. And as for the secondary pharmacology, if the target selectivity is high and no off-target activity, then the uh, exemption of the two-year study may be given. But if the target selectivity is low and the off-target activity is high, then uh, two-year study need to be conducted. The same is true for the histopathology. No relevance and no concern for human relevance, then uh, no need uh, to conduct a two-year study, hormonal turbation, the same. General toxicity, no general toxicity potential, or general toxicity uh, potential, clearly, then uh, in that case, the two-year study may be exempted. Immune modulation, immune cells and the tissue cells may not be impacted or the broad immunosuppression. If that is the case, then the two-year study may be uh, exempted. It's more likely uh, to uh, waive the two-year study. So if you look at the guideline addendum, uh, there are case studies provided. There are four cases for different category of the uh, pharmaceutical product. And the prospective uh, WOE assessment is conducted and the two-year study result is provided. And then the assessments are done. So whether the two-year study need to be conducted or not is decided based on the prospective WOE uh, assessment. The first case is an inhibitor of a viral replication. The prospective WOE assessment says that there is uh, the carcinogenic potential in both rats and humans is unlikely. The compound was sufficiently studied at high exposure margins, and cause for concern was not identified for any of the WOE effectors. And the, for the two-year rat uh, study uh, result, no compound-related uh, carcinogenicity findings. So in this case, the two-year rat uh, study uh, can be waived. Then there are supportive WOE uh, factors, for example, target biology. The non-mammalian viral target excludes intentional alteration of potential mammalian carcinogenic pathway. And secondary pharmacology, of, there is no evidence for the uh, interaction and off-target activity. And for histologic, uh, histology data, there is no uh, six-month toxicology study concerned for the red study. NOIL was confirmed five times difference. And for the hormonal effect, there were no compound-related findings on endocrine and reproductive organ weight or histopathology, uh, no evidence of genotoxic potential, and no compound-related changes for the immune modulation. So for different factors, as I just explained, these kind of a data or the evidence were provided. And then uh, for this case, a two-year study would not add value to the assessment of human carcinogenicity risk. That was the, a 
the conclusion. The second case is an antagonist of a neuronal G protein coupled receptor. And actually, I believe this is a really difficult case because, as you can see here, the carcinogenic potential is unlikely in humans but likely in rats through well recognized mechanisms shown to be human irrelevant. So, the two year rat study would not add value to the assessment of human carcinogenic risk. So the rodent specific liver and thyroid tumor potential was based on the toxicology observed in the chronic rat study and a tumor outcome with the pharmacological class. Hormonal effects due to target pharmacology occurred at high multiples of the human exposure and were not considered a human carcinogenic uh, risk. And in rat, fluorosis was observed but not in human. So these kind of evidences where the factors were provided. So the two-year study demonstrated hepatocellular uh, hypertrophy, but no compound-related carcinogenicity findings. So no need uh, to have or conduct a two-year red study. But if you look at the different factors of the weight of evidence for the target biology, the predominant receptor expression in the uh, brain in the target uh, knockout mice, there was no such a expression. And a two-way red study with a comparable compound did not identify a carcinogenic effect. And as for the secondary pharmacology, thyroid follicular cell adenoma and carcinoma was observed in a two-year red study with a comparable compound which was associated with increased thyroid-stimulating hormone and it is related to an off-target pathway related to the drug metabolism. For histopathology data, they increased the liver hypertrophy and organ weight at 50-fold to 60-fold human exposure and increased the high uh, thyroid follicular hypertrophy at 160-fold to 670-fold human exposure and increased the liver hypertrophy and organ weight and much higher for the human uh, exposure. For hormonal impact, reduced adrenal weight without histopathological correlates and reduced ACTH level. And the live embryo were observed at uh, higher than 500-fold human exposure in fertility study in rats. And also, no treatment-related changes observed in the reproductive organ weight or the histology, histopathology in six months of rat study. And for the genotoxicity, no evidence of the genotoxic uh, potential of parent or major human metabolite, and no uh, treatment-related changes in the immune uh, modulation. And there was an additional investigation, the induction of the CYP1A2 and CYP3A1 demonstrated, and also the bone and teeth of fluorosis related to the release of the fluoride from the compound in rats and demonstrate not to occur in human. So here again, uh, the two-year red uh, study is, uh, can be waived. And the third case is an inhibitor of the ubiquitously expressed serine and uh, their own in kinase. Here, the prospective weight of evidence assessment uh, conclude that the carcinogenic potential in humans is uncertain, and two-year red carcinogenicity study would value to the assessment of the human carcinogenic risk. So it's uncertain, right? So the complex target pharmacology is observed, and uh, the president are lacking with in relation to the drug target and histopathological changes of concern and mechanistic explanation is inadequate from the six month rat study which were supported by the similar findings in the cyanomolgus uh, uh, monkeys. So increase uh, the two year rat test Test study showed that increased evidence, lethality, and reduced the latency of uh, pituitary tumors. So the outcome of the two-year red study contribute to the overall assessment of the human carcinogenic risk. So here, the conclusion was to uh, conduct a two-year red study. And the target biology clearly showed that there is a carcinogenic potential, and the histopathologic data also shows that for the red study, increased incidence and the severity of the renal abasophilic tubules 
and others in the renal cortex, starting a 14-fold human exposure, but human relevance of the lesions were not addressed. And for non-rodent study, um, the, uh, in monkeys, gastrointestinal epithelial uh, degradation and uh, necrosis were observed at the doses 12-fold uh, human exposure and increased evidence of the renal tubal uh, degeneration and others observed at 12-fold human exposure. And hormonal expo uh, the influence increased adrenal weight and cortical hypertrophy in rats at 17 fold human exposure. Human relevance of the lesions were not addressed. So, likewise, here, uh, the genotoxicity and human modulation, the likewise. So, here, the conclusion was to conduct a two year uh, rat study. So there was one more case study, but you can uh, read it from the uh, presentation material. So for the substances which where the two-year study may not be needed, but still the mouse carcinogenic studies in principle need to be conducted. But there should be the application of the three R principles, and therefore we need to transgenic model first. In some cases, the mouse carcinogenic study may not be appropriate. So, for example, when the uh, WA evaluation strongly indicates no carcinogenic risk to humans and the data indicate that only uh, sub-therapeutic and pharmacologically inactive drug levels related to the human exposure can be achieved in the mouse. And the criteria for high-dose selection based on the exposure for rash 2 tg mouse carcinogenic studies, actually PMDA conducted a retrospective study. And as I said, not 25, but 50. 50 fold is appropriate for the rodent to human exposure ratio. So here the conclusion is that the, the two year red carcinogenic study is case by case based on the WOE assessment so that we can assess the uh, risk of the carcinogenicity in humans. So it's kind of an integrated approach. And RAS H2 TG mouse model, here a 50-fold plasma exposure ratio rather to human is an adequate criterion for high dose selection. So I just went through uh, what is being discussed. And what about the Korean situation, step five? It's under discussion. So it can be a part of the notification for the review or the part of the uh, toxicology uh, study uh, regulation. It's under discussion. Thank you.